So um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about this year is getting back to the foundations of what our movement stands for. So we're a conservative shul. We've been around for 100 years. If you see right behind me, it says established 1921, and we are now in 2021, so it's 100 years. Uh, and what I want to do and is really think about what does the conservative movement uh, stand for? Sorry, my internet is a little shaky. And what should it stand for? What are the key core values from where it has been? What has it deviated from? Are there lessons with um, where it has been that we can gain from now? And ultimately, I would like to begin to discuss foundational Judaism, what sits at the foundation of who we are as a people and our faith. And one of the things that I'm going to do is uh, begin with Rabbi Mordechai Waxman. So let me tell you who Rabbi Waxman was. Rabbi Waxman of blessed memory um, was my family, my, my dad's rabbi. He was a great rabbi in Great Neck, Long Island. Let me just pull it up here for you. All right, that's that movie. That's the Pelosi movie. And here's Morty Waxman. All right, so Morty Waxman was a served Temple Israel in Great Neck for 55 years from 1947 through his death in 2002. He is most notable for his interactions with Pope John Paul II. And he was the author of Tradition and Change, the Development of conservative Judaism. He was my father's rabbi. He officiated at the wedding of my parents. Uh, you can see here is his book, if anybody have seen that. That's that title, that moniker, Tradition and Change, really comes from Rabbi Waxman's book, which was published in 58. And that Tradition and Change, that's that's the moniker for our movement. We like to hold on to that. I am particularly fond of that. I like to hold both tradition and change, tradition and innovation together. I think that that what makes for dynamic faith, a dynamic life. Uh, and Rabbi Waxman was someone who I went to when I was a senior in college and I was thinking about three different career paths. I was going to either get a PhD in philosophy um, or I was going to become a rabbi, or I was going to go to law school. And I met with my philosophy professor, great professor, David Wong. Uh, and he said, you know, if you're lucky, you'll get, you know, a professorship in, in Duluth, you know, and because I don't know where Duluth is, I didn't think that that was a great idea. Uh, and then I went and met with Rabbi Waxman. I went to his home in Great Neck. He showed me the sword he was knighted by the Pope and he showed me the sword that the Pope gave him, Pope John Paul II. He did wonderful things for interfaith relationships. The, um, for those of you who are from New York or Long Island, no Rabbi Waxman was quite the presence. Uh, and he said, don't go into the rabbinate. They'll treat you like dirt. It's not what it was 50 years ago. They'll chew you up and they'll spit you out and they'll treat you like an ordinary employee and you don't get any of the benefits that you would in the corporate pretty much what he said to me. So I took that to heart uh, and I went to law school for three years. Uh, and then after I finished law school, after 9-11 happened and began to change, I, went, I met with him just a few weeks before he passed away. Uh, and he, he called the Dean of the seminary on my behalf and he knew at that point that it was time. So uh, he's been quite a strong influence in my family, uh, a mentor to me personally, uh, and certainly to my father, uh, and really dictated how we understood the role of conservative Judaism and, and what it meant to be a conservative Jew. One of the things my mother complained about most or said was most upsetting or was to move out from Great Neck and move out to Suffolk County to get a bigger house because we didn't get to grow up with Rabbi Waxman ultimately as our rabbi. And what I wanted to do is his book is, as I showed you, Tradition and Change. And I wanna pull out from the introduction here. What I'd like to do is pull out from the introduction, the principles upon which he writes at this sort of landmark text that the conservative movement stands for. It's a long introduction. I've sort of edited it up a little bit because I can get to the, the crux of it. And I'm just curious, this is him I guess, what, 50 years since the start of the movement, sort of summarizing 
what the movement stands for. And of course, note 1958 is probably the heyday of the movement. Probably the 60s too were also probably pretty good. So let's open up. Now we've got a little background on Morty Waxman. Let's open this up here. Ignore all of my, hopefully you don't see all of my ridiculous messy desktop there. All right, so let's go now and let's take a look. The ideology of the conservative movement. And as we read this, I really want to have a conversation in 2021 in our 100th year of what sits at the foundation of who we are. Where is the conservative movement now? Does the conservative movement still adhere to or aspire to these principles? And then what do we like about it? What do we agree with? What might we like to bring back? Uh, and what do we want to move past? So uh, if at any point you just want to chime in here, I'll, I'll pause at different breaks, but if at any point you just want to chime in, feel free to just unmute yourself and talk. So the ideology of the conservative movement is more a matter of emphasis than of a radically new doctrine, okay? The religious development and the American Jewish character described it, he just gave history before then and he's gonna give history afterwards. I'm just focused on the ideology section here. Did not in the view of our founders and late leaders of conservative movement call for more than a shift in emphasis. I think it's important when we think about reform, reconstructionist, renewal, orthodoxy, what it means to have a synagogue that is a part of a movement. What, what does that mean? Does that distinguish us from other denominations? What is our relationship to those other denominations? And here Waxman is saying it's not, founders were not looking to start their own movement, but rather it was for a shift in emphasis. Re reform responded to the modern era by revolutionizing Judaism and neo-orthodoxy in the persons of Samson Raphael Hirsch. Samson Raphael Hirsch, you know, if you've been with me before, it was sort of the founder of neo-orthodoxy in Germany in the mid 19th century, sort of a reaction. He was a reactionary character, a reactionary figure against the German Reformation. And less articulate defenders called for a resistance to the spirit of the times. So that one of my favorite Hirsch articles is a piece in which he asks the question, was Judaism ever in accordance with the times? He's very critical of the reform approach, which was to try to make Judaism in accordance with the times. Uh, Hirsch's point was that Judaism's never been in accordance with the times and that's its greatest beauty, its greatest gift. The conservative leaders more traditional than the reform and less obdurate, less obdurate, I guess we are less obdurate than the Orthodox, were disposed to heed the admonition of the sages, be as pliant as the reed and not as unyielding as the cedar. Okay, so that's a good idea of who we should be as leaders, be as pliant as the reed, but not unyielding. The pliancy led to new emphases, but it should be recognized that underlying them were two firm principles. Now here's where Waxman says the two firm principles of the movement are, okay. So the founders of conservative Judaism had no intention of starting a new wing or denomination or party in Judaism. They just, that was not their intention. They did not even pretend to be modern Judaism. Their purpose and their philosophy were clearly expressed in the name they applied to themselves, right? We hear this, we hate that word conservative. Nobody likes conservative Judaism leads into other ideas of what conservatism is. is. Um, but that, the was an expression, conservative Judaism was reactionary, not as reactionary as Hirsch, but reactionary to a certain extent against reform. So they were conservatives and their object was to conserve the Jewish traditions. Marias, Mendes, Kahoot, and their successors and official leadership, Salman Schechter, Louis Ginsburg, and Cyrus Adler, these are all, these are the founders of the movement. We're all scrupulous in asserting that they represented a tendency and not a party. I, just so you know where I'm coming from, I adore this. I really think it's very powerful uh, and something that we have in fact lost. This sort of pick a side aspect of Judaism. I, I, I don't, does not resonate with me and it's something I was exposed to at the seminary in which um, we were sort of on a team. Uh, and that aspect of it, I've always thought a little bit 
silly because there have been times in my life when I have been a Chabadnik. There are times in my life when I've gone to modern Orthodox shul. There are times in my life when I've gone to Mechitza shuls. There are times in my life where I've been reform. I, it's a fluid. Everyone's life is fluid. And to have to pick a team for your whole life didn't seem spiritually resonant with me. So I, I, I'm a fan of the founders approach here. They conceived of their role as that of presenting an organized and meaningful alternative to the reform movement and to Hebrew Union College. Okay, I resonate with that as well, especially I would say more so now that I live in San Francisco than when I lived in Brooklyn. Reform Judaism is different in Brooklyn than it is in San Francisco. Um, and I do believe that San Francisco um, enjoys, has always found great meaning in an alternative uh, to Reform Judaism. So I, that resonates with me as well. When Marias suggested that the seminary be called the Orthodox Sen Seminary, and when Mendes sought to organize the Orthodox forces and to rally them behind the seminary, they were not playing politics. They believed that they represented traditional Judaism. They believed, uh, and, and so did Schechter, who when he organized United Synagogue in 1913, asserted that he was providing a medium for all of traditional Judaism. All right, so let me just read the next paragraph and then I'll pause. The conservative movement has always clung to the position that it is not a denomination in the Jewish fold. It holds that it is Judaism. It is the Jewish tradition continuing along its path in time and space with its characteristic dynamism. It is true that there are other variants of Judaism, Orthodoxy and reform, but then there have always been movements to the left and to the right of normative Judaism. Uh, Mishnaic times resounded to the clash between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes and the early Christians. Eighth century later, Jewry was reft by the conflict between the Rabbinites and the Karaites. Ultimately, the Pharisees and their spiritual descendants, the Rabbinites prevailed and gave a specific tone to Judaism. Conservative Judaism sees itself as being in this tradition, a sort of 20th or 21st century Pharisaic, Pharisaic tradition. While it recognizes that orthodoxy and reform play a significant role in Jewish life, it feels that reform is a revolutionary deviation from Jewish tradition and that orthodoxy in stultifying the inner dynamism of Judaism has taken itself on to a side path of Jewish life. To itself, it assigns the role of being the staunch upholder of the Jewish tradition and of its inherent dynamism. Stop, pause, thoughts. Th that's only one. We agree with that. We like that. When we love, we really like that, right? I don't know. I really like. I really okay. like it, but I don't want to take up all the air. I, I like that, but with qualifications. Um, tell me, to, tell me, tell me. So, uh, it's okay. So, in setting up this, uh, I don't know, trichotomy is even a word, but in setting up, you know, reform as uh, as a re revolutionary departure. Okay, I, I can I can take that. Uh, attacking ortho, not attacking, but contrasting with orthodoxy as a monolith seems a bit of a straw man because we know that orthodoxy is not monolithic. Um, it's very easy to point at Hasidic Haredi movements and say they are reactionary uh, to the Haskala and they departed from traditional Judaism by hunkering down in the face of the world changing around them. Uh, it's less clear that you can make that same kind of argument with, for example, modern orthodoxy. Um, and so I, you know, in my mind, it's not so clear that we can state claim to the, be the inheritors, well, I, the I definitely inheritors agree of the with you. Pharisaic tradition. Yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> but we're going to try to. Um, <laughs> I definitely agree <laughs> with you uh, about uh, orthodoxy. And there are a few times in this course of this conversation in which we do, orthodoxy is, is I guess it's um, a misnomer, uh, is, is multi, is, is, is very, um, has a lot of varieties to it. Uh, especially in this day and age. Now in 1958, that uh, was less of the case. There's much more flavors of orthodoxy than you would have found in 1958. Um, but yes, is he creating a little bit of a straw man around orthodoxy? For sure. But we're trying to carve, he's trying to carve out a niche. And in 1958, consider who the Jewish population was. It was for the most part, second generation people who wanted to maintain in a 
affinity for the synagogue of their parents while sitting next to their spouses. So it was a way to have a little bit of both. Ben Chin. Yeah, um, I just have, I mean, sort of a question, stepping back a little bit. Um, what are these movements for? And why should we care? I mean, I think we're at a moment where there's often as much diversity within these movements as between them, as Tomer was sort of referring to uh, in some sense, talking about orthodoxy, but I think that's true across the different movements, right? I don't understand why you care because, you know, rabbis have to be trained, right? <clears throat> they need seminaries and the, the seminaries are, are, are um, at least right now operated by these movements. But why do we care, right? As, as congregants. Good, I like that. I love why, that why question. We Beautiful. Do we? I want to ask the question, do we care? Do we care that Beth Shalom is a conservative shul? I, I think it's a, I think that's a great question. Marsha Glantz. Oh, and then Gary Sokol. Sorry, Gary. Marsha, then Gary. Okay. Well, you know, I'm glad you keep reminding us this is 1958. Because the conservative movement of 1958 is not the conservative movement or, or not the entire conservative movement of today. Because in 1958, conservative Judaism wasn't egalitarian. That's right. I mean, women That's couldn't right. have bought and, uh, No, they, but they could sit next to their partners, but they could sit but next to their it. partners. But that's almost it. You know, you that was a big deal, but that was a big deal. I know, but to, but to our eyes now, it's, you know, it's not, but we, but in conservative Judaism today, we still have non-egalitarian congregations that say they're conservative. So this whole thing about, you know, we're, conservative Judaism is, is no less a monolith than Orthodox Judaism, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, that's right. I, I think that's true. Uh, there's, uh, you see few, excuse me, sorry about that. You see much, many more, fewer of those, Marcia. Now, I think that used to be the case 20 years ago. But I don't know, especially in light of COVID, especially considering, you know, where, where the movement is right now, if a lot of those synagogues haven't already left. In fact, I know a good friend of mine is a rabbi in a, um, in a conservative shul. Uh, and it, you know, he's to the right of the movement and he just doesn't, doesn't pay attention to the movement anymore. The movement has just left him to the left. And so uh, there is that sense that um, we are going to hang our hat on egalitarianism uh, and people who won't might not fit into the movement any longer. And I, maybe that does call. And, you know, we used to have this at the seminary, Marsha, all the time because we had, and even at Camp Ma. We're, I grew up in Camp Ramah at the Berkshires and they had split minyanim. There was two minions and they were called Im and Bli, with and without, with women and without women. Terrible names, right? Im and Bli. And at the seminary itself, there were two sanctuaries. There was the Women's League Sanctuary, which was the egalitarian one. And then there was the basement, which was the, um, um, the non-egalitarian one. And there was always this sense that we need to be pluralistic as a movement to allow in for non-egalitarianism as well as egalitarianism. And that, that's something I never felt super comfortable with. Uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable with there being a mechitza minion at Shalom, with me being at the rabbi. I, that, um, could that be a pluralistic expression of valid conservative Judaism? I don't know. I think it's a good question. Gary Sokol. Um, to Marsha's thing, I mean, the leading Masorti traditional um, congregation in London has three different minyanim. One is separate, one is mixed seating, but not egalitarian, and the third is egalitarian, and they are one congregation. It's truly stunning. I wanted to go back to what Tomer said, and it's, I mean, I find it fascinating that we so willingly give to orthodoxy that it's the true um, this descendant of Judaism. The rabbis created whole cloth, a new religion in Yavna with the destruction of the temple. And they made up all these rules uh, that met the times as they were. And they added one other thing in there, which is just brilliant, but um, is the thing that conservative Judaism has to respond to is that they said, each generation of rabbis is for, um, and Chochamim is further from, from Sinai than the last, so they know less what was revealed. 
and therefore we can't challenge anything that they knew because they are closer to cyanide. And, you know, they, you know, they had their moment where they recreated everything and then they said, we can't change again. But Judaism, even orthodoxy, if someone back in the temple period saw an orthodox synagogue today, they wouldn't know what was going on. And, um, you know, the, the Orthodox and the Karaites, Rabbinic Judaism and Karatic Judaism, which follows just Torah, is night and day. So I think if you look at the intellectual tradition, conservative Judaism, as it's spelled out, which constantly looking at Torah and Halakha and trying to apply it to the world as we see it, especially as done when we did the talk, um, the class on the metahalachic analysis by Gordon Tucker, trying to bring, you know, God back into the discussion. I mean, we really are dealing with the issues as was done by the Pharisees and the rabbis in creating this new religion that they created. Does it, so let's go back to Ben's question. Uh, does it matter to anyone? So Ben doesn't think it matters if we're in the conservative movement, if we're not a conservative. And raise your hand if you think it does matter. I'm curious, just curious. You think it matters if we're a conservative shul? Okay, Judah, Gary, Tomer, Ellen, Ellen, you wanted to talk. Why don't you take the opportunity to talk? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, my background is from Reform Judaism. And I think that Reform Judaism is very influenced by the union of Reform Judaism. And in my lifetime, I have seen tremendous changes um, in that movement. And, and one of the things... I hope I'm not maligning somebody. I don't mean to malign anybody. I just am talking about my needs. Um, I, I experience services there where they keep getting more and more and more condensed. That the, the big thing is to get out in an hour and more and more prayers are dropped out of the service and um, the melodies of the services are more nigunim. Um, we don't have the words and I'm somebody who savors words in worship. Um, and when I look at all, I'm affiliated with a lot of reform synagogues because I moved from New Orleans. And I support the reform synagogues in New Orleans. I have for years. And I can see that when programs change in one, they change in the other. And the title of the program is the same. So obviously, at least in reform Judaism, that overall arcing um, organization. You don't like, you're, you're not a federalist. Ellen is not a federalist. Um, <laughs> That's all right. I get that. Um, and, and I, I appreciate like that. And I think Reconstructionist Judaism, by the way, Ellen, was founded more so than any of the other movements on the authority of halakha is found not in central office, but it's found in the community, in each individual shul community vote, because the only way the authority can be determined is by the people a part of that community. Bert, hold on. You got to unmute, Bert. Okay, when you were talking about the different services, I attended a few services at the Mission Minion. And the Mission Minion actually, it's just one room. I mean, it's not a synagogue, it's like a gym. And they have where you can sit men and women together, men and women separately. Uh, well, yeah, men and, uh, women separately, men separately, yeah. So it's, it still goes on. And I'm just, you know, when you talk about the various movements, uh, I'm just going to sort of throw my personal 1958, by the way, was the year I graduated from high school. <laughs> and in those days, I don't think it's quite as true today, but Temple Emanuel, and I'm, again, this is my anecdotal, Temple Emanuel was a way out. I mean, I know so many families that drag their kids in the Temple Emanuel, and the next thing they weren't religious at all. They didn't convert to Christianity, they just became like secularists. Uh, when we left another conservative synagogue, a small one, always needing money, Sandra and I, we decided initially we were going to go to Temple Emmanuel. And I just couldn't stand the service. And then we went to Sheriff Israel, and she said, it reminds me of a church. I can't go in that building. So, so it's aesthetics. No, I yeah. you, you're well, it's yeah, aesthetic, I and it's the service. I mean, you know, I'm not going to hide anything. Our lifestyle was certainly more reform 
than conservative and certainly not orthodox, but uh, you know, the conservative service. And then I also have to say just, you know, fitting Beth Shalom sort of into the, into the movements. I think under Rabbi White, it was more very traditional, I mean, non-egalitarian. In fact, we've had some bad experiences having a girl child instead of a boy child with him. Very dictatorial. I'd say, in my opinion, the, the, the three most significant rabbis, you know, and actually, again, talk of age, I've, I've been a member of Beth Shalom about half of that hundred years. Uh, so Rabbi White set a pattern. And then I think the next influential rabbi was Rabbi Lou, and Rabbi Lou brought in all kinds of things. I mean, Rabbi Lou to me was this wonderful combination of almost orthodox and personal practices, and yet, you know, a 60s hippie in many ways. And then I think you were bringing a dish. I think you were the three most significant rabbis we've had. And, you know, it, it does adapt. I mean, it, it, as, as far as the orthodox, I mean, I as a kid went, went to an, the other thing to remember in 1958, a lot of, again, I'm just speaking of San Francisco, although I suspect this was even more true in New York. I mean, was there Orthodox in San Francisco? Yeah. Oh yeah, there was. Was there, it? There were, oh yeah. Yeah, there were several. But they were mainly, what we used to call them refugees. Now they call them Holocaust survivors. And I think they were almost as interested in, well, I mean, there was the Polish temple, there was the Polish one, Knesset Israel. And then there was the German one, which became B'nai Amuna. Uh, and they were more interested in, in you know, bringing in their, their rituals. Uh, they were more interested in- Doing, doing the way that their stuff, that's right. Yeah. That's all it's all, it's, we, you, are, we, are we from that. Germany? We're from Germany, we wanna keep the German, of course, the Minhagim and that, and it, so, so much of it is about aesthetics. And for me, there is definitely an aesthetic thing going on when I go to Emmanuel, okay, come on. That's aesthetically different than Bet Shalom. No judgment, it's just different. It's and I think people- German, It's a 19th century German Protestant service, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and you know, for some people, that's gonna be very meaningful. Now let's go to number two, the second principle. In making the conservation of the Jewish tradition their objective. So that's what we're about, right? So our objective is to conserve Judaism. Bert, you're saying some people would go to a reform synagogue and that would be, they'd come from the old country, they go to the reform synagogue, the next generation is not Jewish anymore. I think a lot of the numbers do bear that out, but whatever. Um, okay, so these these leaders, they want to conserve Judaism. They don't want to make it, you know, you have to, from how you tie your shoelaces in the morning to brush your teeth at night, every step of the way to be Jewish, but we want to conserve Judaism. There's value here, all right? So the founders and the leaders of the conservative Judaism were not blind to the pressures created by the American Jewish scene and by the modern world. They recognized that the survival of Judaism was imperiled by non-observance, as Bert just mentioned, by ignorance and by intellectual confusion. But they were not prepared to make those factors the determinants of what Judaism is and should be. Catch that? That is not non-observance, ignorance, or intellectual confusion. That was not the determinants of what Judaism should be. The conservative movement has not really been a mass phenomenon even though it has attracted the loyalty of a great number of movements. It has sought to shape the community rather than allow the community to shape it. Its thinking and goals have been derived from the Jewish tradition rather than from doctrinaire or sociological forces. It feels that the Jewish community is malleable, that it is reclaimable, and that it is potentially at least devoted to Judaism. The problem as it sees it is to state Judaism in meaningful terms, to focus attention on its essentials and to communicate these things to the Jewish public. Starting from these underlying principles that the Jewish tradition must be preserved and conserved and that American Jewry, Jewry must be molded to that end, conservative Judaism evolved not as a doctrine but as a technique. The technique consisted of emphasizing the following aspects of Jewish tradition. Okay, so we like that, Judaism as a technique. Mm. I like number one a little bit more than I like number two. Ben? Uh, I just want to bring up something. It hasn't been mentioned. I'm guessing it probably won't be, but I think it's meaningful in terms of when we're thinking about who we are and who we want to be in the future that might be different, which is, and you alluded to it, the ethnic component of the movement, right? <clears throat> I mean, it started with, with a 
specific population, right? It's been, um, uh, you know, uh, in some ways a keeper of the culture and traditions of that population. Um, and, you know, is that explicit anywhere in what anybody is saying or writing about conservative Judaism? And I think you have to face it if you want to change it. The fact that it's I think we, the I, fact I, that I, it's I, the fact that it's white and Ashkenazic that yeah yeah I mean that's yeah. true of every conservative synagogue um, I've ever been to right I think it's something that needs to change right if there's going to be a, a future for um, conservative movement synagogues but it doesn't seem to be something that people are really talking about. Uh, well, we are talking about it. Our, as you know, Ben, we are talking about it at our show uh, because diversity, because of because diversity and equity. Uh, yes, is but it's about of... diversity, right? I mean, it, it's tell me. It's, um, diversity assumes sort of. A, a, I, I, we talk about diversity, but not diversity from what? Where do we? Where do we start from? Right. I don't think. I think we talk about diversity in terms of welcoming, right? In terms of making people, reaching out to people that- um, But ultimately they, the rules are gonna be made by the guys, the Ashkenazi white guys with the- But beards. I don't think we've talked about cultural transformation, right? I don't think we've talked about changing the kind of language we use, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, right? When the language we use among ourselves, when uh, we want to signal that we're in our group is Yiddish, right? What is that? What you, when you say good Shabbos, what does that communicate? That happened to me. The first event, first event I led here was, uh, I never forget this, was it was in um, <laughs> Mountain Lake Park uh, for the preschool. And all the preschool, it was an opening kickoff in the park with the preschool, a bouncy castle. And I said, I wanna introduce myself. I'm Rabbi Dan Ain. I'm so thrilled to be here in San Francisco. My wife is here, my family's here. We're just looking to bring Yiddishkeit, more Yiddishkeit to the community and to San Francisco. And somebody came up to me, I said, Rabbi, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not interested in Yiddishkeit. That's got no connection to me. I'm, I'm Persian. So yeah. that, you know, that, that, that's right. I think that's exactly right. I think, ben, I mean, yeah. I think- I think I, we're, we're used to talking about diversity as a win-win and it's not. You sometimes good, have to lose something. Good, but I, but stick up, but stick with that. So stick. Everyone think about diversity and look at the next lot because I adore. He's going to take Shechter's cash Catholic Israel and try to explain it here. And I want to know Ben what you think about in terms of diversity and in terms of this ideal of Catholic Israel. Tomer, uh, I just want to make a quick counterpoint, which is that um, now I don't know the background of this, but at some point in the history of the conservative movement. We all switched to the Sephardic pronunciation of Hebrew. <laughs> yes, it's we started the, from Ash, we started from Ash. It's after forty-eight. Well, of course, but the, there was. Uh, I mean, I've tried to research this, but I can't find any information about it. This is like a big shift, and you think there'd be some documentation of how this big shift happened, but I haven't found anything. If anyone knows, I would love to know. But it is saying something that a group of a movement extracting from Ashkenazim now we're all using the Sephardic pronunciation. Uh, so, I mean, that's something interesting in terms of a melding of different streams within Judaism. Yeah, I, I think the reason for that might have been is because a lot of the Hebrew teachers that I had as a kid growing up in Hebrew establishments were Israelis that had just come over. I mean, I think part of it, I mean, I don't Maybe. even know if it, I, I'd, be, I'd be curious to ask it. You know, one of the things they taught us at the seminary is just be consistent. Don't switch in the middle of a bracha from Ashkenazi to Sephardic. That would drive the professors up the wall at the seminary. Marsha. You know, I think with time, the, 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 um, the Ashkenazic generation, my parents' generation, the ones, the immigrant generation, the, the Europe, Eastern European immigrant generation is dying off. And we have a new generation or several newer generations that do not know, that are gonna know less and less about that Ashkenazic history. And because they really don't know it, they don't feel it, they are not going yeah. to feel it important yeah. to keep it as much. And so some yeah. of these other traditions will then, like our new melodies, 
that are not from the Ashkenazic melodies, you know, we're getting more Sephardic melodies, they will gradually take over. It doesn't change conservative Judaism per se, but it does change that flavor and it makes it so, it makes it so that you are not um, alien if you don't come from that background. I guess that's I, 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 um, I think that's right, Bert. And then I want to get to the Catholic Israel. Well, piece. I just yeah. want on the point that was made on uh, by Tomer on the, I was bar mitzvah in 1953. So I've studied pretty much from 1952. My first teacher was a very <laughs> elderly, it was, it was all the best show. This very elderly man, named Mr. Goldberg, obviously, who taught all the bar mitzvahs. And I learned Ashkenazic. And then, I don't know if he died or retired. I don't remember. My, my mother did all this. I switched to Joe. I don't, Marsha probably remembers Joe Kornfeld. Joe Kornfeld was a guy at Beth Shalom. Now, he taught me in, in Sephardic. So when I actually did my bar mitzvah, I did it in Sephardic. But a friend of mine, you know, Mr. Goldberg must not have died, who, who stayed with Mr. Goldberg, he did it in Ashkenazic. And then one other thing on the diversity, well, two sort of related points. And again, this was not at Beth Sholem, although it could apply to Beth Sholem. With this other conservative synagogue I was at, during the high holiday services, I was an usher and I was sort of in charge of showing the, 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 the nursing mothers where the room was. Every single one of the nursing mothers was Asian at that synagogue. Uh, and if you look at our synagogues, I, I mean, again, I'm not, I don't know the background of everybody here, obviously. Some of the most active members in our synagogue have been primarily women who've converted and from, from various ethnic backgrounds. And then I had one last thing where my poor wife put her foot in it and we were talking about Jewish people, how they look. And she said, oh yeah, there's only five Jewish faces. And she got you know, reamed out. She got really attacked by several of the people that were in the group and she apologized. I mean, you know, what she obviously meant was the world she grew up in, they were all Russian Jews. So anyway, I think diversity, uh, uh, you know, uh, I agree with Ben, we don't really talk much about it, but boy, it's here and it's here in Beth Uh Thank God. Howard. Uh, uh, one, one vote from Young Israel of Newark. Um, <laughs> Young Israel of Newark, sure. I, um, it was an Orthodox shul and uh, I, um, they told us, I guess I couldn't have been much more than 10, that it was, we were, our pronunciations were because of Israel and what uh, the way they sounded there. Yes, that's that's how it was presented to me, uh, to me as well. Okay, so this is an interest. So Schechter is known for this term, Catholic Israel, um, which is a beautiful concept and a terrible term, um, which doesn't help anybody understand what he's talking about. So I'm really I love that Waxman explains it here, and well, let's see what we think about it. The phrase Catholic Israel is, in its English form, a nimble paradox born in the fruitful mind of Solomon Schechter. For those who don't know who Solomon Schechter is, just let me just show you who Solomon Schechter is. I mean, he pretty much is the conservative movement. Solomon Schechter was a Moldovian-born American rabbi, American scholar, and educator. He was the founder of the United Synagogue and the president of JTS and the architect of American conservative Judaism he died in <laughs> 1915. And he looks like we do, uh, or at least like I do. All right. Like he was from England. Like an Ashkenazi. That's right. That's right. He was that's from England. That's important. What? So let's go now. And he had this idea of Catholic Israel, um, which has never been used since. But it derives from the solid and meaningful phrase, Klal Yisrael, which we've heard, right? Klal Yisrael, we've heard, which is the totality of Israel. Jewish tradition has always maintained a sort of theological equation of its own, whose best statement is found in the words of the medieval sage, God, Torah, and Israel are one. This formation asserted the close relationship between faith and God and his primacy, primacy in life and history, the Torah as the means of coming close to God and God's will by thought and action, and the Jewish people and its history through which the faith and the action are carried. God, Torah, and Israel are one. Now, to make the equation workable, it was always necessary to recognize not only the demands of God and Torah, but the needs, the ability, and the situation of the Jewish people. Can't ignore the needs and the situation of the Jewish people. 
Apparently, this harmony was maintained rather successfully in Jewish history. In the modern era, however, it came to grief. Reform Judaism in the early 20th century virtually eliminated the Torah as it had developed through the Jewish ages. It rejected many of the legal elements of the five books of Moses, and it denied the relevance and validity of Talmudic law and thought uh, and the codes which stemmed from it. Samuel Adler, one of the leaders of American reform, put the matter quite clearly when in a Passover sermon, he said, we are like the Israelites at the Red Sea, or perhaps to use a Maybe we're like those at Yavna, right? Right. That seems to be the one a little bit more in vogue, perhaps. We are like the Israelites at the Red Sea. Let us strike the sea of Talmudism. Wow. With the staff of reason. Oh, heaven forbid. Splitting it, pass through to the other side. So, sorry, that was a uh, um, reason should not, then you might as well worship reason. Sorry. Even as it rejected Talmudism, so did reform spurn the Jewish people the national element of the equation. It denied that a national sentiment existed. It extirpated the hope for a return to Zion from its prayer book. So it just took out this idea that we're gonna to return to Zion, right? Next year in Jerusalem. It thus reduced the equation to one element, God and an ethical religion, right? That's his interpretation of what reform became. Orthodoxy distorted the formula in its own way. Here you go, Tomer. God and the Torah remained primary in its equation. The Torah indeed was accepted in all its jots and tittles as it had been deployed in interpretation through the years and as it was formulated in the 16th century code of Yosef Karo and in the 16th century commentator of Moshe Israelis. The Jewish people, however, received shorter shrift. Some elements of orthodoxy were bitterly opposed to Zionism and some minor groups still remain so despite the existence of the state of Israel. The real distortion, however, appeared in the refusal to recognize the needs, the history, and the sociological condition of the Jewish people as a factor to be reckoned with. Orthodoxy upheld the claims of the Torah irrespective of the needs of Catholic Israel. Everyone following him? Does everyone have it? Everyone got it? Right, so reform Judaism, they just, they removed everything except for God and ethics and orthodoxy just wasn't concerned so much with the situation that the people were in. You can't keep Shabbos, sorry, you can't keep Shabbos. Then don't do anything and stay in your home. And don't go outside and don't ever kiss anyone. Sorry, right? They're not gonna take that into consideration. The conservative position has been that the balance in the equation must be restored. I will note, I am a Libra. It eagerly accepts God, by the way, that's not a Jewish reference. It eagerly accepts God and Torah as the fundamentals of Judaism, but it asserts that the national sentiment, which is part of Judaism, must be acknowledged. And so conservative Judaism has gone hand in hand with Zionism since its inception. That's a, that's a charitable reading of the history of the conservative movement's relationship to Zionism. It equally asserts that the needs and the state of the Jewish people must be taken into account. And so it has been concerned to face the current facts in Jewish life. We have to consider where we're living. We're not living in some utopian place where we can not carry to shul. Sorry for some of you. Like the carrying, to, how do we do carrying? We can't get the A-roof over four blocks. We literally cannot get our A-roof over four blocks. We have to take that into consideration, right? Or do I just tell people, sorry, I can't move the A-roof four blocks? That's kind of the question that I'm posing with these conversations. Okay. Uh, English readings in the service, for example, is not a principle of conservative Judaism, but rather a realistic recognition that most Jews don't understand Hebrew and many don't read it. The retention of Hebrew in the service and the concentration upon it in the conservative religious school, on the other hand, came out of the recognition that the Hebrew language is a cardinal binding force in Jewish life and a major element in Jewish history. Thus, the Jewish need is at once recognized and the national principle and historic outlook are maintained. Tomer. So I think in my mind, I need a little bit more um, ammo for his assertions. So 
Uh, I, I can see the case with, uh, you know, the people as this uh, triumvirate of God, Torah, and people uh, being invoked in vis-a-vis -vis Zionism. Okay, I can see that. That makes sense. Aside from that, um, uh, what exactly are the examples? Are we thinking, for example, like with the liturgy, uh, like he, they allude to the uh, to the liturgy? Gay people marrying. English. Gay people marrying in shul. Well, I'm thinking more something closer to 1958. So sure. if you okay. if you have innovations like more English in the service, um, orderly prayer. So instead of it being a chaotic mishmash like an Orthodox synagogue, these Germanic Jews wanted order. So there'd be a page announcement. <laughs> there would be English instructions about what part of the service are we Very in good. and what part of the service Very are we good. transitioning to. Um, uh, aside, is that is that the heart of it, or are there other big chunks that I'm missing because he's not giving the ammo? Yeah, I guess uh, so. Tomara says, "What's the context here? What are the conflicts?" I'll give you the main. Con Here's one conflict. You ready for this one, Tomara? Can I drive to Shul on Saturday morning if I can't walk there? Sure. Can I? Can I allow that as the rabbi for people to turn in their you know engine? and drive their car to the synagogue? Can I say, you know what? It's halakhically acceptable for you to get in your car, turn the keys and drive to shul. So that was one of the main controversies. And the reason for that controversy is, well, again, 1958, you're moving out to the suburbs. Can't walk to shul anymore. So this was a live controversy. Can I eat fish in a trafe restaurant? Another live controversy. Can I do that? can ultimately can women count in a minion um are we going to take into the considerations of the needs of the people who can't walk to shul anymore are we going to take that and say you can use a car to get to shul or are we going to say too bad you can't have the car and what he's saying here is that the conservative movement will consider the sociological position that the people are in and try to create some sort of balance between integrity to the tradition and some sort of accommodation that allows people to make their way to shul. So they did agree to allow people to drive to shul. And that was the most maligned, one of the most maligned tissue vote that the movement wrote in the 20th century, because from a, I guess, strict constructionist standpoint, you fire, turning on a combustible engine with fire. I like to say the Teslas make it maybe a little easier, but the, 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 the it's true. But the fire element is pretty foundational. Uh, but they said being together in community because of we're so, we're, we live in the suburbs, we're miles away from each other. The shul, I'd say I lived on Long Island and my shul three miles from my house, two and a half miles. So I want to go. So will you allow me to go or will you tell me I can't? And basically, because the conservative Jews live so far away from each other, there was no other option. So you could either do with a lot of, I think, um, uh, Howard Shul, Young Israel. <laughs> young Israel, they just parked three blocks away. I live, uh, three, I live two blocks from the Shul. And did people park in front of your house? Never. Ah, yeah. <laughs> all right, well. Um, but they all walk. Uh, it's because they all walk. There you go. Well, um, there's an intellectual honesty thing here that we're going to get to and that Morty Waxman is going to get to in a little bit. But I see I see Ben has his hand raised. I, but anyway, Tomer, those are the controversies. In particular, getting to shul is really what they're trying to figure out here. How do we get people to Saturday mornings if they can't walk? Ben. Yeah, I mean, what you're talking about, it seems to be all, I mean, you know, sort of halachic questions, right? And, and that... I mean, Schechter alludes to that when he talks about, you know, Torah as one of these pieces. But it's a bit of a stretch because, I mean, he, you know, he, he could be, he then starts talking about, well, the use of Hebrew, right? And there he doesn't, um, he's not talking about halakha. He's talking about, you know, the centrality of the Hebrew language in our you know, practice, whatever. Um, I think, I mean, and, I mean, this goes back to what I was saying before, maybe, and, and to my original question as to why we care. It seems to be a lot of this is cultural. Um, and and the denominations are a way of really positioning ourselves 
in the culture. And there is, a, I, I think there is maybe a meaningful, I mean, you talked about stylistic differences, right? But those are cultural differences between reform conservatives you know, and, I, I, and, I, and orthodox. Like and when you, when you talk about the language of, of the service, that's a, it's not a halachic issue, it's a cultural issue. And I think maybe that's where really more of the nub of this is than in the sort of, you know, more conceptual areas. And present company excluded. Present company excluded. I think a lot of people choose their shuls based upon the aesthetic or the cultural elements. You don't have to exclude me. I, I include <laughs> myself. It, I mean, of course, you, you want to, if you're going to go somewhere every week or every month, you know, you want to be in a space where that feels, I think, maybe somewhat familiar, if that's an option, and, and, and comfortable, right? And if, if you see signifiers of what you see as your own culture there, it's going to, you know, it's going to help you feel comfortable there. And I certainly, you know, had it when I was shul shopping, it's like, oh, does this feel right? You know, it's just, a, it's a big part of it. Mm. Makes it hard to grow. Makes it hard to grow. That, I mean, that's, that's where I, that's kind of where I am. Is, you know, if you put the primacy on an aesthetic that was really resonant in 1985, it's going to be hard to grow in 2021. Uh, and you're right, though. And I, for me, I think the mistake in the denominational is defining them theologically. I would love to define our shul non-theologically. Let's not, you know, like that might be a fascinating way to break down different denominations. Um, uh, this which mitzvot you do and what mitzvot don't you do and all that sort of stuff. I, I don't know. I, I think we're, I like the Catholic Israel for the reason I mentioned earlier, which is that I've been at all parts of Judy. I've taken advantage of all aspects of Judaism in different parts of my life. And, and that is, um, uh, I think that's Judy. That is Judaism, not take a side um, and, and say you're the only right way to do it. And that's why diversity and pluralism, uh, I think, is so significant to a religious life. Now, he goes here and he talks about positive historical Judaism. Now, the natural complement to concern with Catholic Israel is attention to the historical past of Israel. And this is exactly what Ben was saying. The conservative movement has recognized the fact that every generation is an omnibus in whom all its ancestors ride very mellifluous. And so it has sought enlightenment for the perplexities of its day in the historical experience of Israel. Three attitudes have emerged from this emphasis. A study of Jewish history has first of all made clear that each generation has built on the past, uh, built it upon the past. No generation starts de novo. Judaism has been a historical growth, which has sustained the Jewish people and has been sustained by it. It was because reform Judaism was deficient in its sense of history as applied to the Hebrew language, that Zacharias Frankel abandoned its Frankfurt Conference in 1845 and went off to find conservative Judaism. In abandoning it, he proclaimed the doctrine of positive historical Judaism. Still later, it received elaboration at the hands of other future leaders. As a cardinal emphasis of conservative Judaism, it means respect for the Jewish past and a discernment of its guiding principles. Chief among them is that, as Sajid long ago pointed out, Israel is a nation only by virtue of the Torah. Respect for the historical character of Judaism, therefore, means respect for the religious legal system, which has been developed as the means of preserving and effectuating Judaism. You can't just disregard kashras. You just can't. It means respect for the religious legal system is what positive historical Judaism means. However, historical Judaism means something more. It involves a recognition of the fact that Judaism has changed through the ages, and with it, it involves an understanding of why and how it changed. Conservative Judaism calls attention to the fact that Judaism through the ages has manifested an inner dynamism. It has proved able to adapt itself to changing conditions, to move on from a faith and a way of life based upon a physical fatherland, to one which found its home in a portable fatherland, the Torah, to move from land to land, from age to age, to remain contemporaneous. This is the fact of change. The reason is to be found in the internal dynamisms of Judaism interacting with its external circumstances. The masters of Judaism did not and could not ignore the winds of circumstances and doctrines which swirled about them. 
Judah, the patriarch, found that his contemporaries were not observing the interdiction on the oil of the Gentiles, he caused it to be revoked. When Maimonides found that the philosophical doctrine constituted a threat to Judaism, he composed his guide for the perplexed. The Jewish world reflected this propensity for change in accord with circumstances in other ways. While the essential forms remain the same, many customs, here are the customs of the Oriental Jews differed from those of the Eastern European Jews, and many of the prescriptions of the codes are accompanied by the statement, in this, we follow the custom prevailing in our land. Well, that, by golly, Ben, is going to make a diverse shul complicated, isn't it? It is. Conservative Judaism, being historically aware, thus confronts the need for combining reference for the past with the fact that Judaism has changed. The third element that rises out of historical awareness is the manner in which change has been effected in Jewish life. And here it becomes quite obvious that the tradition has changed not by revolution, but by evolution. It has itself provided the mechanism for legal change and interpretation, and so has grown in the face of the uh, ex exigencies of life, even as the common law or the American constitution has grown. A notable example of this is afforded by the Talmud, which is as a whole, the cardinal example of Jewish tradition. They say, look at the Talmud. We evolve, we argue, things change. And over time, we figure out what the law is. So the dispersion of the Jewish people inevitably lead to the problem of what status to accord Jewish civil and criminal law when they were in conflict with the law of the land in which Jews resided. The problem is resolved in the Talmudic formula. The law of the land is law. Thus, Talmudic law showed its capacity for modifying itself even to the point of self-limitations within the framework of the law. So what we're doing is just that. We're understanding, Dina de Mahuta, Dina, the law of the land is the law, is, uh, it's a concession to halacha, no kidding. Obviously, it's a concession to halacha, but come on. We have to live in a culture, we have to live in a society, and we have to take that into consideration. So that makes us the authentic Jews because we take this dynamic process of figuring out what God wants from us, figuring out God, Torah, and Israel together with a balance in a dynamic way going forward that doesn't put the locus of authority totally on you and whatever you think about God or put the locus of authority totally on some old guy with a beard 2000 years ago. It, it tries to create a balance. Now, Rabbi Gilman used to say that he preferred that we didn't call the movement the, they, for a while they tried to find a different name at the beginning of this century. They failed at that. And uh, I think Wolpe wanted to call it covenantal Judaism. Anyone remember that? Wolpe wanted to rename the movement covenantal Judaism, which somehow is worse than conservative Judaism. Uh, Rabbi Gilman wanted it to be the, he wanted it to be the community uh, movement in tension. In tension, that we are in tension. We embrace tension. We don't embrace easy answers. We exist in those conflicts between what does God want from us and what are we capable of doing inside the community in which we live. Um, also, not a very compelling moniker. Uh, so, what I it's one o'clock now, and we've only made it about four pages through. But I want us as a community to really think about it. We're, we've got some more months. We all know we've got some more months before we go back into that building. And it is 100 years. So we should think about in this great reset, this time of change, what is the shul we want to go back to? What are the founding principles that actually um, are the ones that we want to push forward into this next century? What are those elements of the tradition that do we want to hold on to and preserve? And what are the things that have to change because the circumstance that we find ourselves post COVID is undoubtedly different than the one we found us before then. All right, so I'm gonna stop the recording.